Okay, welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Pleasure to be here. Welcome to our virtual event, how to effectively transform food systems with new inclusive governance. So my name is Matteo Zanella. I am from the Global Alliance for the Future of Food. We are a strategic alliance of philanthropic foundations working together and with others to transform food systems today and for future generations. I'm particularly pleased to be your moderator today, an event of the One Planet Network's Sustainable Food Systems Program, a global MOOC stakeholder platform tasked with the goal to accelerate the shift to sustainable food systems. The One Planet Network is a real plus 20 mandated mechanism for the implementation of the SDG 12, which is the SDG on sustainable consumption and production, and recently had its mandate renewed by the UN General Assembly in 2021. Among other working groups, the One Planet Network hosts a community of practice, linking professionals from diverse institutions to discuss how to promote and how to implement a food system approach on the ground. So this event is an outcome of these colleagues who participate in this community of practice, uh, which discuss the potential, the achievements, the challenges of a key emerging model of food governance, sustainable food systems, mood stakeholder mechanisms. But before we dig into the topic, into the agenda, let me just review a couple of housekeeping rules. Uh, we will have a panel. So we will also have the chance of collecting questions. You might post to our panelists via the chat box. So when posing those questions, please do not forget to introduce yourself and your organization. This can be posted in the chat box. I think everyone now more or less know how to work with the chat box of the Zoom, which is also very interesting too, to explore conversations among yourselves. All right, so there is a growing consensus that food systems must be governed in integrated participatory and inclusive ways. And this debate is much more urgent because our food systems are increasingly vulnerable to global threats and are at the root cause of many of the crises we currently face. Persistent food insecurity, unhealthy and unsustainable diets, climate change, biodiversity loss, these become exacerbated by shocks such as those posed by the COVID-19 pandemic, or more recently, the war on Ukraine. These challenges are complex, they are interlinked, they are persistent. And to address those, the international community has more consistently referred to rethinking food systems governance and institutional arrangements to promote inclusive collaboration and to embrace a variety of voices from different types of actors and from different types of agendas in lieu of individual and sectoral perspectives. So how would these mechanisms would look like? Today, we'd like to discuss one particular approach, one particular institutional arrangement that has the potential for embedding inclusive food system approaches in policies and actions. These are what we call sustainable food systems, mood stakeholder mechanisms, or simply put MSMs. MSMs, they refer to formal or informal participatory governance mechanisms or collaborative arrangements that brings together diverse food systems actors, government, private sector, NGOs, farmers, generally with different food related agendas, uh, be it environment, health, trade, agriculture, nutrition, and in an inclusive way to collaborate in pursuit of sustainable food systems. Albeit still limited, there is growing evidence on what works and what doesn't work in this type of mechanisms. So for instance, we'll start our session by referring to a recent study co-developed by the Alliance Biodiversity and CIET, the United Nations Environmental Program and the Worldwide Fund for Nature, which analyzed 10 examples of national and subnational multi stakeholder mechanisms, bringing very interesting remarks, very interesting lessons in this topic. Another issue that we will discuss today relates to how these multi stakeholder mechanisms are or are not being leveraged by different countries in the context of the United Nations Food Systems Summit, which you all know took place late last year. As you also probably know, the Food Systems Summit generated hundreds of dialogues, independent dialogues, member state dialogues, which were used to form what we call national food system pathways. In some contexts, we did observe an interesting articulation between existing and also between emerging mood stakeholder mechanisms to contribute to this process. By, but in other contexts, we see that different routes were taken. 
So this question continues to be very highly relevant because the UN Secretary General Statement of Action, the document which concluded the Food Systems Summit, there he calls for the need to, to the implementation of national pathways in an inclusive way with stakeholders playing a pivotal role in supporting country implementation of actions towards sustainable food systems. So our session today has two main objectives. To introduce the key challenges, potentials, limitations, and drivers of success of sustainable food system with stakeholder platforms based on the study that I mentioned, but also based on very interesting flagship cases that will be brought by a very interesting panel. And second, to discuss where, whether multi-stakeholder mechanisms were useful and or effective in practice by looking at concrete examples of the food system dialogue process, shedding light on if and how they were used to conduct the dialogues, also discussing their future role. How we will do those during the next one and a half hour, we have three moments. The first moment I will call the representatives of UNEP, WWF, and FAO to provide some opening remarks, so further refining the context of our debate. My colleagues will be uh, putting the slide of the agenda. In the second moment, we will have a very fantastic panel, to be honest. We have six distinguished speakers from six different countries that will present and discuss their concrete experience with mood stakeholder mechanisms, including lessons learned within the framework of the food system dialogue and the national food system pathways. And this is the moment that we'd like to collect your questions, collect your points, and maybe pose them to the panel. In a third moment, we invite a colleague from the Alliance of Biodiversity and CIT to offer us some avenues on how to deepen this debate. All right, so with no further ado, let me call James Lomax. James has been the Sustainable Food Systems and Agriculture Program Officer in the UN Environment Division of Technology, Industry and Economics, based in Paris since 2009. James, let me just confirm. Please turn on your camera so we can also see. Okay, perfect. I see you now. Excellent. Definitely here. Could you please provide your remarks and tell us a little bit about the study of the 10 national and subnational cases of sustainable food system mechanisms? Um, and also, if you can make your address in five minutes, that would be excellent. Up to you. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. And, and um, just a little bit of an update. You obviously have an old bio, which is, of course, uh, sometimes happens, but I've been actually with the Ecosystems Division of UNEP in Nairobi for the last three years, where I coordinate our food systems work, and also where I was very lucky enough to be seconded to the Food Systems Summit Secretariat. So just to give an update. So thank you so much for inviting me to open this, this um, webinar. Um, as many of you might know, and, and you people that are on the call and, and all the participants, um, this approach is very close to my heart. It's been very close to UNEP's heart now since we started working or trying to think through actually how can we actually operationalize what a food systems might mean in practice. Now that might seem like an easy thing, but bearing in mind that until sort of 2012-13, food systems was still a very um, nascent emergent concept. So it's very exciting that after the little bits and pieces of work that's been going on from, from UNEP, from One Planet Network, from SEAT, et cetera, and, and forgive me if I don't give all of the people that have been involved. Um, we, so, so from that sort of embryonic stage where we really started to think what a food systems approach might mean, we were very lucky enough to have the Secretary General calling a, a whole world summit, um, specifically looking at food systems last year. And what was interesting about that was that it firmly mainstreamed this idea of interconnectivity of food systems. And the fact that if you can address food systems in a connected way, so food, agriculture, plus its related impacts, whether they be climate, biodiversity, health, you name it, then you are actually going to be accelerating your country's um, 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 uh, uh, um, action towards achieving all 17 SDGs. So it was 
really very, very timely that the One Planet Network and its um, a community of practice on, on um, food, sy food systems approaches on the ground worked specifically on looking at some key examples. And I'd like to share with you eight very important lessons that were learned from this particular piece of work. And bearing in mind that, okay, now everybody talks about food systems. Literally four years ago, it was a real struggle. And there are some people on the call here like Joao, uh, like Mark, like Michael, that we have all been really straining, if you like, to get this very much politically high on the priority lists of member states, of businesses, et cetera, of even the UN. And now we can safely say we have. And critically, the way that the Food Systems Coordination Hub, which is the follow-up to the summit, that's being stood up in, in Rome. We all have to collectively ensure that these approaches, so these integrated approaches, are very much mainstreamed and included when it comes to the implementation and coordination of the 100 plus national food systems pathways that were developed for the summit. So the eight lessons, I've already mentioned the first one, but a food systems approach is critical when it comes to, to bringing in and these multi-stakeholder me me mechanisms, mechanisms are the only way that we're going to tackle the wicked intertwined problems of like I said, climate change, environment, health, poverty, et cetera. That is the first thing. The second thing is these multi-stakeholder mechanisms have to be institutionalized and they have to be part of a participatory decision-making processes. They, we've got it, the third one, we've got to include the power balance gap. We've got to make sure the right people are around the table and not be afraid, not be afraid to bring up some of the systemic issues that drive our food systems. We have to make sure that all people, so the fourth one is making sure that, that it, they are inclusive. Let's make sure that everybody, all stakeholders have equal representation, irrespective of whether they're powerful or they're not. The fifth one, there has to be very good engagement and collaboration and proper leadership and facilitation within these multi-stakeholder mechanisms, also key. We have to have a blended participatory and deliberative democracy way of working. This is very important. Um, the seventh one was the fact that um, a, a holistic food policy has to be founded on a holistic participatory food system diagnosis. Now, I know there are a couple of uh, people on the line here that are working on, for example, certain methodologies, true cost accounting, um, uh, life cycle analysis, all sorts of things that contribute to this diagnosis. And those have to be brought in and they have to be done in, in a way that brings everybody on board with the results. And the last one is that, is that um, these multi-stakeholder mechanisms are imperative if we want to understand trade-offs related to these very complex food systems issues and to navigate these controversial topics, but also recognize that we're only a, a little bit there. And look, I'm six minutes in, I'm gonna stop my stopwatch. I went one minute over. I'm gonna leave you with one last gem. And that is the food systems a summit is the point of departure, it's not the point of arrival. So this work is crucial, but it's only at the very, very start. So UNEP stands ready to work with all of you to make sure that we nail this going forward. Back to you, Chair, thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, eight points to get started. I think these are really key insights to start our discussion. Interesting work. <laughs> Just know each other before the session started and I forgot to check your bio. Sorry for that. But um, let's move on then to the next speaker, uh, João Campari. João is the global lead food practice of WWF. Prior to his leading position at the WWF, he served as a special advisor to the Brazilian Minister of Agriculture and has led programs at the Nature Conservancy. João, I know you and your team have been very active at the Food Systems Summit, co-leading action tracks, organizing, participating in dialogues, 
contributing substantially to the process. What are the lessons that you take from this, from this experience in terms of inclusion, participation, what worked, what didn't work? And how do we ensure moving forward that multi-stakeholder mechanisms and other processes aimed at the urgent need to transform food systems in more inclusive and participatory ways? Yeah, thanks, Matthias. Delighted to see everybody and very happy to connect with my good friend, uh, James, and share the opening remarks with him. And thanks also for, for, for everybody to join this, this webinar and for the organizers to invite me to, to speak. Look, it's not new for this, uh, for this group in this session that the need to transform our food systems has never been more urgent, right? How we produce and consume food today is the single biggest threat to nature and is contributing to about one third of all greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, the latest um, IPCC report, which was just launched uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, outlined the critical threats to global food security of projected, projected uh, temperature increases, uh, while we are reminded of the fragility of our uh, supply chains on a regular basis. We saw this through the pandemic, and now we are seeing this to, due to conflict. Uh, but it is still possible for food systems to become part of the solution to development, nature, and climate crisis, rather than being part of the, the, the problem. So many critical decisions will be made this year, uh, especially, such as the adoption of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework, while there will be also important negotiations at the land and climate COPs this, year's, this year, and Stockholm uh, Plus 50 meetings. The frameworks, these, these frameworks are super critical. Uh, however, we must concurrently explore other inclusive models which can drive action on the ground, one country, one city, and one community at a time. To address food security, climate change, and nature loss, we need member states of the United Nations, subnational governments, and other stakeholders to come together. Multi-stakeholder mechanisms uh, are really essential as there is no silver bullet solution that one group will be able to deliver. We need inclusive and collaborative processes uh, to, to drive the change that we aim to achieve. Uh, we also need to stop chasing single solutions and embrace the complexities of and both solutions instead of either or solutions. Through this webinar, uh, and I welcome the, the, you know, the, the opportunity to be here and the sustainable, uh, food system, uh, sustainable food system paper on multi-stakeholder mechanisms, we are seeing examples of how to deliver impact, be it in implementation, uh, through policy engagement, or even fundraising, because fundraising is absolutely necessary uh, to ensure that power imbalances are addressed and that the voices of smallholders women, indigenous peoples, local communities, youth, and others are continuously raised. Food producers are some of our most important environmental stewards, and they must be part of the decision-making at all levels. The UN Food System Summit, uh, as James uh, mentioned earlier, is a good example of the power of inclusive processes. Led by the action tracks and the summit dialogues, thousands of people and organizations came together to increase momentum in food systems transformation and to build coalitions and hubs that will live on lo long after uh, the summit ended to drive implementation and take accountability for action. As James reminded us, the summit was uh, a departing point. It's not the destination. Uh, the coalitions that have emerged in the summit and the national pathways that continue to be de developed must, however, work alongside uh, rather than in competition with existing uh, multi-stakeholder mechanisms. For instance, the CFS voluntary guidelines are a crucial tool to bring together multiple stakeholders and provide a reliable framework for transformation in a local context. The Coalition of Action on Healthy Diets from Sustainable Food Systems for All that emerged from the UN Food Systems Summit is a dynamic opportunity uh, to build on the work of the CFS and the energy generated through the summit process. We have to identify these clear opportunities for the coalition uh, to align 
with and complement existing CFS mechanisms. The last thing we need is divided efforts to reach the, the, the same uh, outcomes, right? So inclusive conservation uh, and inclusive decision-making uh, aligned with conservation, with the mission of WWF, and we look forward uh, to working with other stakeholders across food systems to build mechanisms that are diverse, representative, and impactful. Only by doing so, and this is my last message, can we achieve food systems transformation at the scale and with the urgency needed to provide everyone with enough healthy and nutritious food, limit global warming, and reverse biodiversity loss. Food production consumption needs to stay within planetary boundaries. It's time to break silos now and implement inclusive solutions. Uh, thank you very much, Mateus. Let me hand this over uh, back to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, João. Thank you for your points. Uh, very, very instigating ones. Um, let's directly move to Adriano Campolina, our next speaker in the line. He is the senior policy officer in the Economic and Social Protection Unit of FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. And Adriano, the summit has generated great momentum. Uh, and as we mentioned before, helped to consolidate some sort of a consensus in terms of the need for food system approaches. Now, many people are questioning, I'm questioning myself, how to keep this momentum? What are the challenges ahead? What is the role of FAO and, and the hub on this? And how can multiple stakeholders participate on this process? Thank you very much, Mateus, and, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, I represent ESP. ESP is the, is the rural, rural, Inclusive Rural Transformation and uh, Gender Equality uh, Division on FAO. So I do not represent the hub, uh, because as you know, it is still being uh, uh, fully established. Uh, in fact, as you mentioned, there has been a very strong mobilization process towards the, the summit. Uh, the inclusive dialogues were one of its key components. Uh, they happen at all levels, local, national, supranational. Uh, and more importantly, they have involved uh, a quite large group of different stakeholders, uh, and they discuss intersectorial proposals for food systems transformation. I think this is a quite crucial element because uh, uh, if you look into a territorial, a territorial approach uh, to food systems governance, we need exactly to promote uh, multi stakeholders participation, uh, multi level integration, and multi sectoral coordination. Uh, I would like to, to ask for permission to also mention another two important elements. And that mention comes from my previous life before joining FAO. Uh, I was in civil society and I was uh, being an observing member of Conselho in Brazil uh, for many years. Uh, and I think there are two fundamental issues there. One is about addressing power inequities. And another one is about uh, promoting inclusivity. Uh, the transformation of food systems uh, without really taking the power relations in a much more sophisticated analysis. It's not only about uh, inviting people to a stakeholder dialogue, but also understanding the power inequities that are behind the situation of power, uh, 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 of power disparities. Understanding, for instance, asymmetries of information asymmetries on capabilities of advocacy, asymmetries on access to decision makers. So we have not only to have the most stakeholder, but have a very strong uh, and very defined strategy uh, to address the, the, the power relations, uh, the asymmetries of power relations. The same with inclusivity. Uh, we, and I was also part of the action track four uh, process uh, uh, in, 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 during, this, during the summit. And uh, we've got the impression that in many ways we have to push and push and push to make sure that inclusivity will be at the center of the agenda. There's always a risk uh, that inclusivity will be the last one to be mentioned, will be the last one to be uh, uh, really uh, taken into consideration uh, very seriously. Uh, having said that and moving to how to make sure that we keep the momentum, I think the most important uh, uh, process is that we don't just wait and say, okay, summit is done, that's all fine. Uh, I think uh, I agree that the, actually the summit is a starting point uh, and within that starting point, uh, we will need to really have a very strong emphasis uh, on our processes of organizing, of bringing people together, of bringing different types uh, of, uh, of stakeholders uh, to push uh, some fundamental agendas. So for instance, uh, FAO 
uh, we are we are supporting and facilitating a ad hoc working group on territorial food systems uh, that uh, involves around 50 organizations uh, to strengthen exactly uh, 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 this process of uh, understanding territorial food systems and promoting a governance process that allows the transformation, the sustainable transformation of such food systems. So we are developing also, uh, uh, or actually not developing, but renewing a white paper uh, on territorial development with our partners GIZ, CIHAD, UN Habitat, IFAD, and others. Uh, and we are piloting participatory territorial food systems diagnosis in several countries. Uh, it's important to mention that because uh, after the summit, uh, we need to not to wait, but rather to connect the different types of activities that we all have uh, with both the process of making sure that the pathways, the hundreds of pathways, uh, uh, the 100 plus pathways uh, will be implemented and there will be accountability around that, uh, but also uh, to make sure that the coalitions uh, will continue uh, in a way that is coordinated and that is uh, coherent. For us, it's important to recall that the territorial approach uh, is absolutely important in this aspect. Uh, first, because it reinforces uh, the moat level the multi-level integration process. Uh, it is uh, absolutely key uh, that we really get better into understanding how the different levels of action from local to sub-national sub to national and international uh, can be critically uh, uh, achieved uh, through this process. We also uh, believe that uh, through the territorial approach, uh, we can increase policy and program coherence between various decision-making processes and scales of action uh, to increase operational coordination and improve cross-sector effectiveness at all spatial levels, learning from and responding to the lessons of uh, the pandemic. Uh, and also territorial development allows us to anchor rural development and food security and nutrition strategies on specific territorial assets and interdependencies between rural and urban communities. Uh, so colleagues, uh, I think uh, I would like to, to finish here just saying that we do believe that the territorial approach could be therefore uh, an overarching framework in the Food Systems Summit follow-up uh, and will be available and interested to continue, continue to support this process. So thank you very much and I wish you an excellent uh, continuation of this workshop. Thank you, Adriano. Fantastic points. I took note of just two, which for me just bumped in my head, um, addressing core inequalities and facilitate inclusivity and I'm pretty sure the next session which is the panel that we are going to open right now will also discuss those with concrete examples uh, so let me then just move directly to the panel I'd like to just call our colleagues um, to turn on your cameras it's always nice to see your faces the faces of the whole panel formed starting with Patricia Palma de Friarosa uh, she's director Program of Information Systems for Resilience and Food and Nutrition Security for the SICA region, the General Secretary of SICA, the Central American Integration System. Do I see you, Patricia? Let me check. Yes. Anna yes. Taylor. Hi, Patricia. Just, just a second. I just introduced the others, but I do see you now. Sorry, I was fighting with the camera. <laughs> camera view. Anna Taylor, she's the Executive Director of the Food Foundation was a participant in the building of the England National Food Strategy. Hi, Anna, see you there. And Catherine Ma, Canada Research Chair in Promoting Healthy Populations and Associate Professor. She was also a participant at the Canadian Food Policy Advisory Council. Let's start with the three of you. Um, we have discussed before how we would organize this debate. This will be a fantastic conversation because you have different levels of experience in interacting with um, multi-stakeholder mechanisms, the food policy and the food councils of your country, the regional platform of SICA, but you also had also different experiences interacting with the process of the Food System Summit, which build the national food system pathways. So maybe let's start with you, Patricia. Um, you belong to an organization, a, a regional platform, right, which interacts with a number of countries. What was the kind of support and involvement of your organization in the dialogue process, the food system dialogue process? And where do you see the support was important to involve a broader range of stakeholders in these dialogues? If, if you can keep it two to three minutes, that would be great so we can have a more engaging discussion. Thank you. Um, yeah, 
first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation and have the opportunity to share our experience in Central America. Um, I'm a part of CICA, which is the Central American Integration System. Uh, it's conformed by uh, eight countries, uh, Belize, El Salvador, Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Guatemala, Honduras, Panama, and Dominican Republic. Um, as CICA, we are uh, we prioritized since uh, the end of the 90s, the food and nutrition security uh, as part of the political agenda. And also we have a process of uh, develop a, an important governance in the countries and regional and local levels. Uh, that process uh, was very important for the prioritization of uh, food systems, especially uh, during the pandemic, uh, uh, we have a con contingency plan, and this uh, topic was uh, prioritized uh, as part of uh, in a structural a structural uh, component of uh, food security and development in the region. So uh, we organized the uh, regional dialogues. Uh, uh, it was uh, convened by uh, the Pro Tempore, which is uh, a, one of the countries in charge of the Secretariat of SICA. In that case, was Costa Rica. It was convened by them and the General Secretariat of SICA. And we have an important participation of international agencies such as FAO, World Food Program, uh, IFAD, GLAD. Uh, Iica, um, uh, save the uh, no, sorry, the um, scaling up nutrition and the University of Costa Rica. Uh, in that dialogue that was uh, based on the uh, names that the dialogues from UN had, uh, was intergovernment intergovernmental dialogue. Yeah. Uh, and we have the participation of all sectors, including governmental, uh, NGOs, producers, municipalities, universities, professionals, uh, the private sector, among others. This process has been very important because the countries also did their dialogues and uh, the different institutions did their dialogues, but in the in the regional dialogue, we had the opportunity to converge with all these experiences and prioritize the uh, topics that were very important for the region. Uh, I would like to say that the most important uh, uh, lesson learned here was that since we have been working for a long time with the governance of uh, food and nutrition security, it was very, uh, not easy, but it was a very rich, the, the process was very rich in terms of the level of participation and commitment that the different sectors had, including what I mentioned and indigenous people and, and uh, at different levels at regional, uh, national and local level, which made this very inclusive kind of dialogue. Excellent. This is a very important point to take note. Um, and I think our colleagues will also discuss something similar. Let's uh, switch quickly to Anna. I know, Anna, that you have been involved in the England National Food Strategy. And uh, we discussed before that actually the interaction between this and the food system process, food system summit process was not actually uh, what, what people were expecting. So could you please, please tell us a little bit more about why the lessons learned and best practice for developing this national uh, food strategy in a multi stakeholder participatory way. And maybe we can discuss a little bit of the Food System Summit process right after. Thanks, Matthias. Um, so just to give everybody um, a little bit of context, back in 2019, um, the government um, requested um, an independent review um, in the form of a national food strategy for England. Um, that's a 
a, a particular thing in, in UK politics, um, an independent review when somebody expert is invited to provide advice to government. And in this, in this instance, it was to develop a national food strategy to which the government would, would review and respond and decide what it wanted to take forward. Um, I uh, run a charity in the UK called the, the Food Foundation, which is working on food system change in the UK. And I was asked to be the chief independent advisor to the independent reviewer. So somebody called Henry Dimbleby was the person asked by the government to write the food strategy. And I was helping him do that. And um, in fact, you asked Matthias about the uh, sort of connection to the UN Food System Summit process. In fact, the inspiration from that process did appear in, in England very early on in, in 2019 when we started this journey. And we had uh, observed the work of the sort of food system dialogue work that uh, David Navarro and colleagues had been leading around the world. And we thought it would be really interesting to bring some of that inspiration into the UK. And he very kindly convened a, um, a dialogue process back in May 2019 when we were at the very start of the work. Involved, involving a wide um, mix of stakeholders and that I think set the tone very well for the work that followed on the national food strategy but I wanted to just give a little bit more detail I mean the the engagement work that happened over the subsequent two years the strategy was published in the middle of 2021 the the work that followed was incredibly elaborate um, and multi-level and I can't describe it all now but I thought I'd give you a bit of a flavor of the work that went on with citizens directly, so that particular angle. And there were um, four key elements to that. First of all, there was, um, we set up five regional uh, public dialogues, which involved 180 citizens. We deliberately, they were chosen to be representative of the wider demographic in the regions from which they were selected. Um, and they went through a three-step process. I mean, I think um, James at the start talked about one of the lessons being the quality of engagement and collaboration. We had experts running these dialogues who have done run dialogue, public dialogues in multiple other situations. Um, they led the work. Um, we, uh, and that was a process of really exploring with citizens, um, first of all, uh, taking them on a journey of understanding some of the issues around the food system that they might not be familiar with, and then really exploring the areas where they felt intervention was needed. Um, we also, in parallel to that, did a whole program of youth engagement. So we did workshops with, in 24 schools and youth clubs. This was teenage, teenage children um, involving more than a 420 young people. Again, we chose the schools and the youth clubs to be have a mix of levels of deprivation, ethnicity, to really get that um, broad level of inclusivity. And again, that was to really tap into what we wanted to try and understand um, how young people's values around the food system, how they would look at issues around so animal welfare versus health versus climate change and some of the other impacts of the system and weighing up some of those priorities, because obviously there are trade-offs to be had. Um, we also, the two other elements were um, uh, focus group work. So when we got to the latter stages of really having some kind of more firm uh, policy proposals, we wanted to explore those in more detail with, um, again, demographic groups that were chosen on various characteristics, try and get a picture of a, a range of different political perspectives on policy choices. And then we did more polling, which was much more getting a national, nationally representative um, opinions around specific ways of framing um, some of the policy choices, because we wanted when the, when the recommendations were published, we wanted them to be well received and land well with the public. I think the main lesson for me through all of these, uh, these different elements was that how vitally important it was for building um, in some ways a sort of license to act on the part of government. So it was all about really understanding where the public felt intervention would be valuable, would actually help them to eat more healthily and more sustainably. Um, and in the areas where they felt that they didn't want intervention. And so get, and there were really big differences. For example, if you talk to the public around sugar compared to when you talk to them about meat, you know, we saw really important differences and that had a material impact on the types of recommendations that we were making. And of course, that could also, that also helped to 
build confidence with the government that we were listening to what citizens were saying in the recommendations and that reflected that broad input from citizens across a really diverse range of audiences. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, uh, Matthias. I'm very happy to give more detail if needed in the conversation. Thank you very much, Anna. And I think this is uh, an interesting example how we sometimes use different, the same terminology for very different things. Like one is a regional platform that Patricia was explaining, giving support to governments. And there is a sort of a historical collaboration with these governments. And what you're describing, it's sometimes um, building policies from, from, from the bottom up, right? Really engaging citizens in participatory politics. And it's interesting for us to start to digress and detail a little bit of those mechanisms. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we have to move to Catherine. Um, Catherine, similar question to you, uh, coming from Canada. Tell us a little bit about your experience being involved in the National Dialogues of Canada. Uh, we know about the creation of the Canadian Food Policy Advisory Council in 2019. So in your view, what's working, what's not working in terms of food stakeholder participation in, in these processes? Well, thank you so much for having me and for the interesting study and uh, event today. I will begin with a little bit of a timeline as well, similar to Anna. So the inaugural meeting of Canada's first ever Food Policy Advisory Council was held on March 4th, 2021 uh, online. Uh, and the UN Summit, the Stage 3 Dialogues for Canada, were held just you know a few weeks later in April and May of last year. So as a national council, we hadn't even had the chance to you know, spill the proverbial coffee on each other's shoes at some kind of basement meeting before we were you know, attending the summit events. So as a result, I would say that there was not yet the voice of the council uh, to bring to the dialogues. As such, you know, so when I personally attended, I attended as an academic expert in nutrition, uh, as a citizen of my community and of Atlantic Canada and all the other constituencies that I serve and identify with. So at the dialogue that I attended, I, you know, I found myself sorted into these multi-stakeholder rooms where I knew many of the other participants who had worked on topics uh, you know, at all levels of governance and with deep professional and local knowledges on topics such as uh, household food and security measurement for decades. Um, but also in the room were those newly represented and asked to join in the conversation on the topic, and also uh, those newly tasked to engage with each other to support conversation on the topic, to support a systems approach, which was, you know, considerably harder. So I do remember this very distinct feeling after those first couple of months that I had found myself invited to a dinner table, uh, sitting down, being very hungry, but then being kind of tapped lightly on the shoulder and asked if I could actually go back into the kitchen and inform how to now cook the meal. So of course, like timing is never really good in policy. And if the pandemic has taught us anything about policymaking, we have good leadership, good decisions, preparedness of good institutions, good process, but never good timing. You know, scientists are going to operate on academic time, NGOs on funding time, communities operate on their local time, politicians on the electoral cycle time, and of course, public servants we know operate on hurry and wait time. And this is like, you know, long periods of study where they're going to prepare uh, these detailed studies of the issues, specific issues, to then meet very urgent specific requests for options from the minister, the deputy uh, at any given time. So because the National Council is so new, I do want to speak briefly uh, before I end uh, to the most satisfying moments, I would say, in my past multi-stakeholder experiences, which were on the two municipal food policy councils that I've served on previously. So this is in Toronto and in St. John's, Newfoundland, Labrador. Um, and of course, this is also informed by other scientific and technical bodies that I serve on, which I would also call uh, multi-stakeholder in some way. So the most satisfying moments in these in these other committees are really on resolving practical issues. They are coming head to head with conflicting interests and conflicting views in a transparent way to address very practical problems, like practical problems in municipalities, such as backyard hens, of zoning, uh, of 
you know, property taxes and how we're going to address uh, how potholes and parking relate then to the food system for that city. Working on practical changes is really, really essential to what we're talking about in food systems because the path of exercising influence, like representation is only just a bare minimum for systems change. What we're talking about to address these practical problems is institutional change. Institutions that we very well know were built on colonization and the taking and holding of power by force. So being in, in, in an inclusive and multilateral group should make it safer for those diverse voices to come together and not riskier for any single contributor to do what they cannot accomplish alone. So it's often stated, you know, when we talk about food systems, that inclusive processes are the ones in which diverse individuals can see themselves in this mechanism and the outcomes. And we often talk about food as the glue, the practical glue that brings people together. But we also know that food is a driver and it's a highly visible measure of inequity in our societies. It's a reflection of who holds power, who's fighting for it and the scale of the challenge. Because in a food systems approach, most of the policy levers to enact this lasting change that we want are not in the food system. They lie well outside of the food, of, of food if we're going to talk about health, sustainability, prosperity, and equity. So I want to conclude with the idea that the success of multi-stakeholder mechanisms may not depend on their institutionalization. I would say that it depends on how effective they will be at prompting us to take a hard look at the underlying conflicts, as well as our institutions to rebuild them for the future. Thank you very much, Catherine. Very provocative thoughts uh, bumping my mind right now. And I think these are also interesting thoughts for um, maybe one or two quick follow-up questions. Still have a couple of minutes. Let me go back to Patricia. Uh, Patricia, um, something that I, I heard when you were speaking, uh, still in my mind, is um, you mentioned that one of the most important lessons learned from your experience with Sika was there was already some sort of collaboration, historical collaboration going on with the policy officers that were participating in those dialogues. And that actually made much easier to uh, provide an exchange of views and to build the dialogues, the processes. And, and now I'm hearing Catherine saying, um, time is never great for policy. So um, where do you see the feasibility of new mechanisms that are being formed right now to contribute to processes that are so urgent, such as climate change, food security, et cetera? Um, excuse me, what is the specific question? <laughs> <laughs> the specific question is, you mentioned that the, the possibility of people having collaborating with yes. a great deal of time make it easier. So what if you don't have this time? What if it's the situation that Catherine was saying, uh, we have to form a mechanism to deliver this outcome in an year or so? Is this yeah. still possible to work? What kind of support can we give to this? I, I think what... Uh, Catherine was mentioned is, is very important in terms of, uh, yeah, you, you have the, the uh, policies, in this case, food policies or development policies, and you need to have, yeah, you need to have an institutionalization um, of those policies, but also you have to get involved all the population. If, if, if we really think in the coherent sense of public policies. Uh, what I can see is that we need to do a process at different levels and we have to get involved different people and we have to commit these people to understand uh, what they, the most important issues for their development and for food, their food security are. Uh, I think what we one of the strategies that we have been using is the uh, training of people, but training at the level uh, in practice. Uh, they they go to the communities and they learn with the communities. So you have a, a double effect 
in that. So I think this is not an easy process. This takes long time. This, this, this needs a, an important strategy to understand what are the main causes of the problem and also to understand that the current food uh, system fail because we have a lot of problems and we need to introduce new concepts and rescue a lot of uh, knowledge and practices that uh, we also have. I'm talking about the, our region that we have for uh, developed for a long time. So I don't think that is one, one uh, situation or another. I think we have to find a mechanism to uh, make this real with the participation of everybody because you can keep the communities alone doing whatever and it's impossible to have the governments trying to uh, take uh, action uh, with the community. So I think uh, we need to work at different levels and and there are a lot of experience in Central America that eventually we can we can share. And I think this made uh, possible, but is, this is not a thing that you make from one night to a, a, a day. I, a, it takes a long time and we have to mature and be realistic in terms of what we are talking about. That's good. Excellent answer. Uh, thank you very much. I still have one or two minutes, so maybe I can pose a very quick question to you, Anna. Um, we have spoken about leveling the playing field and there are also some people in the chat discussing this uh, in the um, in the report that we published we mentioned a couple of activities that we think would make it easier for leveling the playing field uh, financing the participation of less powerful actors building tools for capacity building which patricia just mentioned which for you is maybe the key aspect of how we could level the playing field based on our experience in here that's a really good question. Um, we certainly we did uh, provide some enumeration for citizens involved in the various processes. Um, but I don't know if that was, I mean, I think that was probably vital to secure their participation. Um, but it doesn't go to the more fundamental point that I think you're talking about, which is um, how you i don't know i mean i think in our experience when we've what we also i mean in our in the work of the food foundation charity we do quite a lot where we um try and ensure that people who are very disadvantaged get an opportunity to speak about their lived experience to people that have a lot of power so this might be young people from disadvantaged families speaking to ministers in department for education about school food for example so I think, um, uh, and what we try to do is be the intellect, create those opportunities, the platforms through which those people can have a voice and speak directly in their own terms and with their own priorities directly to people. And I, so I think perhaps um, ensuring that there are genuine opportunities that are not tokenistic for people so that they actually feel like it's a, um, a set of interactions in which they have genuine agency, um, I think is, is really important and it not being a kind of tick box exercise, I think right. is, is really vital. Okay, that's also a very good answer. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm afraid we have to keep moving on. I could have these conversations for another hour or so, but uh, we still have other colleagues, but um, excellent points. We still have, um, some interesting examples from Portuguese speaking countries, which is now the next part of our panel. So let's then move on to our colleagues from Moçambique, São Tomé e Príncipe, and the CPLP, the Comunidade de Países de Língua Portuguesa. I maybe like to start with uh, Minister Francisco Ramos, uh, the Honorable Minister from São Tomé e Príncipe, and the minister will address in French. So I will try to, after his, his speech, summarize the points to the best of my capacity. And he also has prepared the presentation so everyone can follow the points. Um, so, s'il vous plaît, Monsieur le Ministre Francisco, uh, j'espère que vous nous écoutez. J'ai une question pour vous donner en 
en tant qu'organisateur national de dialogue sur le système alimentaire dans votre pays, comment avez-vous organisé ce débat et comment les plateformes existantes ont soutenu l'inclusion de multiples parties, de multiples acteurs dans le débat? Est-ce que je peux voir le ministre? Parfait. Ministre? Oui. Oui, parfait, je vous écoute. OK. Bonjour et merci pour l'invitation. Comme vous le savez, Saint-Domingue-Principe est un pays insulaire composé de deux îles situées à l'océan Atlantique, à côté du golfe du Guinée. Historiquement, euh, nous étions euh, une colonie de plantation et un entrepôt de claves dans l'Atlantique. Nous sommes donc euh, de bonnes productions de matières matière, euh, premières pour l'exploitation, comme le café, le cacao. C'est aussi pourquoi nous n'avons euh, jamais pu consolider une classe de producteurs alimentaires familiaux. Nous sommes euh, membres du comité des pays de la langue portugaise et participation activement depuis. 2011, à la construction d'une architecture de gouvernance du système alimentaire avec une approche territoriale, c'est-à-dire multiniveau, multi-acteur et multisectoriel. Dans le cadre de la préparation de zones, euh, nous, nous sommes les Nations Unies sur le système alimentaire durable. Nous avons suivi la démarche décidé au sein de la CTLP. Je ne ferai pas référence, car le docteur Lapon le fera certainement. Euh, nous comprenons qu'il n'aurait pas de sens d'établir des mécanismes nationaux de dialogue sur une base ad hoc, car nous avions euh, déjà au Conseiller national de sécurité alimentaire nationale. Notre conseiller national est composé de tous les ministères concernés de la société civile, du milieu universitaire et du secteur privé. La participation des acteurs concernés est basée sur les, des règles visant la réduire des asymétries du pouvoir. Il s'agit donc d'un conseiller conçu sur la base d'une approche des droits de l'homme, en particulier le droit de l'homme à une alimentation adéquate. C'est un organe de coordination entre secteurs et des participations sociales pilotées au plus haut niveau par l'État. La présidence appartenant au premier ministre qui convoque les réunions euh, et la vice-présidente du ministre de l'Agriculture. Le conseiller s'articule avec le niveau local et sous-national, soit au niveau du conseil de sécurité alimentaire nationale de la CPLP. Dans le cadre du processus de dialogue national, des réunions décentralisées ont été tenu au niveau communal aussi que des réunions sectorielles en partenariat avec d'autres ministères. Les résultats de ces décisions formelles, locales et sectorielles portaient une réunion nationale du Conseil de sécurité alimentaire et nationale sous la présidence du premier ministre. Je tiens à souligner que nos recommandations ont ensuite été intégrées dans les recommandations du groupe du pays de la CPLP. Je voudrais également souligner que dans ces processus, le Conseil de sécurité alimentaire et nutritionnelle du centre de principes a approuvé politiquement l'élaboration d'une stratégie nationale pour la transformation du système alimentaire basé sur la transition vers une production 100% biologique et des et modèles de consommation. Cette stratégie nationale a eu construction avec 
euh, nos partenariats du développement, particulièrement avec la FAO. Nous sommes convaincus que les euh, nous permettra d'améliorer notre alimentation, euh, de consolider nos producteurs familiaux, de protéger notre environnement, de diversifier les, les opportunités économiques en milieu rural et de valoriser en plus, plus nos produits d'exportation. Sans la tête de gouvernance, mise à la place dans les pays, il serait difficile de gérer les consensus nécessaires pour l'appropriation de cette um, importante stratégie et il serait plus difficile d'établir les partenaires euh, nécessaires à son élaboration. Euh, ensemble, euh, nous allons plus loin. Euh, merci euh, pour le Vote attention. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le ministre. Muito obrigado. Je vais essayer de faire une petite synthèse, si vous me permettez, pour notre participant qui ne parle pas le français. I will try to make a little synthesis of the minister's points in English. Uh, so he was expressing that because of the historical orientation of his country towards export agriculture, uh, Santo Tomé Príncipe has never been able to consolidate a domestic food system. But since 2011, also through the cooperation with the community of Portuguese speaking countries, there are strong efforts in the construction of a governance architecture uh, with food of the food system with a territorial approach. That means multi-level, multi-actor and multi-sectoral. Uh, once they were invited to elaborate the national food system pathways, they realized it would make not sense to establish a national mechanism for dialogue on an ad hoc basis because they already had a National Council for Food Security, a National Council for Food and Nutritional Security, composed of all the relevant ministries, civil society, academia, private sector, with rules in place to reduce power asymmetries and operating on the basis of a human rights approach, particularly the human right to adequate food. So they held decentralized meetings at the community level, sectoral meetings in partnership with other ministries, and brought those results to a national meeting of the Food and Nutritional Security Council under the chairman of the prime minister. As a result, the Council on Food and Nutritional Security of Santo Tomé Príncipe has approved the elaboration of a national strategy for the transformation of its food systems based on the transition to 100% organic production and consumption model, which is under construction with many development partners, particularly the FAO. And he finalized by saying that without this governance structure in place, it would be very difficult to generate the consensus necessary to approve this important strategy. It would be even more difficult to establish the partnerships necessary to, to develop them. J'espère que je, je fais en synthèse que c'est vraiment la reproduction de, de votre pensement, eh, ministre. So, merci beaucoup. On va continuer avec la session. Merci. Thank you very much. Let's go back, let's come to a different Portuguese speaking country. Um, I have now um, the pleasure to pass the, the floor to Mohamed Nemane um, about his experience from Mozambique. Um, Mohamed is Director of Cooperation from the Ministry of Agriculture. And the question to you, Mohamed, is um, we know that Mozambique has a National Food Policy Council in place, which also operates under a participatory and a rights-based approach Yet the country took a different direction when designing the national food system dialogue. Could you please tell us a little about how this played out? The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for inviting uh, Mozambique to share the experience on the issues. Uh, when we received the invitation from you in speaking about uh, uh, to start the process of seed, uh, uh, food system, uh, we had meeting and the, as you know, Mozambique, uh, uh, we have the National Food Security and Nutrition Council and uh, the, 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 the role is ex exactly to do this process. But uh, uh, the reality is completely different. When we see the definition of food system, starting from the beginning where it is uh, to plan how you to want to produce until after you eat what you want to do with the West, okay? 
And when we see the role of this uh, council uh, in Mozambique was only to cover three or four steps of these definitions. The second point for us to take a decision to go on another way was, okay, we don't want people to make confuse uh, between food nutrition, food security with these food systems are completely different because food systems is more border and the food uh, security and the nutrition is small. It's something that uh, uh, is inside of this system uh, 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 food. So during the discussion, uh, we decide, okay, let's go create one uh, uh, group, one uh, uh, stakeholders engagement process, where the members of that stakeholders are different and the complete uh, 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 engage in the process. As James said here, we need to have people with brave, people who are speaking on the table, people are putting in uh, uh, good uh, uh, thoughts, put, uh, people are pushing the process uh, 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 more, uh, 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 how you say, uh, strong to have the, the good uh, uh, feedback from the, 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 the participants. And then you have Katarina said also here that there is no need to make this institution uh, 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 the process, okay? You will need to have people with this capacity to involve more people, to speak, in, to, to have more ideas, to give an idea on this process. So during the process, we decide, okay, let's go put the group and that group, the member, will have few people from the government and more people from civil society, private sectors, community, uh, to, to put more, uh, when we go to speak with people, put those people are be consulted more comfortable where they can speak free, okay? When the, uh, on the other hand, where you have the, this uh, uh, council from food security and nutri nutrition, those people, when they won't speak with them, they are not feeling free. They, they are afraid to speak because the, the group are more members from the government rather than the, the civil society and private sectors. So we as government, we decide, okay, let's go put the, set up this group and take this action as, as, as a priority for us. So yes, we, dis, we decide to do that because we realize that the council that we have doesn't cover everything on, on food system. Also, uh, the people are very tired, are very fried. Uh, when they see these councils coming, uh, uh, it's the same answer, it's the same question. So they are, they are not participating, they are not involved because they are being involved in the process and nothing changed, okay? So they are tired. So with this new group, uh, uh, the, the mentality was different. Is why we set up this approach to go uh, 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 out of this. So I'll stop here and thank you for everything. Bye. That's very clear, Mohamed. Um, I have a, Mohamed, I have a, a follow-up question, if you may, um, which is uh, we are, everyone is now wondering about next steps. Um, so as, as our speakers in the introductory remarks have said, um, the, 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 the food system pathways, they're not the arrival point, but rather a departure point. So we should start seeing this as a process, a continuum. So um, how, how is this playing out now in Mozambique? How are these different actors get involved considering what you just explained to us, which was the way that uh, Mozambique has uh, developed uh, its, its uh, dialogue processes. So I'll look into the future. Yes, uh, let me tell you, more people were speaking. Uh, uh, the, the, the summit happened in Roma was beginning of the process, okay? And they are right about that. Uh, when we came here, uh, uh, we sit and we decide uh, uh, have meeting with high level people. Uh, as you know, Minister of Agriculture is leading this process. We take these issues to Minister of Council. We said, okay, we come back from uh, Roma. The, the, the issues was blah, A, B, C, D. The next step now, because we have this uh, uh, string uh, uh, task force, national task force, they are pushing the government to do the action plan now, okay? Uh, last two weeks, they were on one uh, 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 workshop 
to, 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 to planning the action plan for future. What are we going to do now, okay? So in a few weeks, we're going to have the action plan and then we come back again to the government and say, look, those are the action plan. We need to start work on, on, on delivering the, 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 the action plan to the sectors. And then, because we have one uh, chronogram where we have like next year, what are we going to do after next year in five, five what are we going to do? So the action plan is involving all these sectors, okay? All NGOs, private sectors, uh, community, government are engaged in the process. But after we decide the action plan, we do the plan, the action plan, we have to deliver those action plan to their boss because the, 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 the technicians are inside, they are discussing this action plan. And then we, uh, from that, we can go forward and do the monitoring evaluation of what we decide on actual plan. Thank you. Thank you, very clear. Thank you very much, Mohamed. Uh, okay, excellent. Um, we had another colleague who will be joining us, but he is uh, facing some problems to connect. So maybe we could use those uh, remaining minutes of our panel to just collect more questions from the audience. It's always great that we have this time. Sometimes we have to rush with, with the panelists and we miss this opportunity, so actually, uh, we have a couple of minutes to uh, collect a few questions. And I was reviewing what we had in the chat, and there is one that I think would very, fit very much uh, you, Catherine. So if you're still there, it would be great that I can pose this question to you because I, I was unpolite. I didn't pose you a second question as I did for the others. So maybe you could start with you. So uh, it's related to the, um, the, um, the issue of institutional change. And maybe just to provide you some context for this question, I, I come from a country that is, is known for its experience with participatory politics, the CONSEA, the Council for Food Security, etc. But when there was a political change, uh, these institutions, they also suffered. So they lost budget, etc., etc. So how, how do we face that the politics move sometimes in a direction, sometimes in another direction? Do we need to have flexible institutions? Uh, what, what would be potential solutions for building institutions that resist those political changes? I guess my short answer to the question uh, is really very much from the perspective of being an academic, which is, you know, how do I work in this very large uh, institution? Uh, do I need to, uh, you know, create new working groups inside or external to this, uh, inform the institution, et cetera? And I really come to the conclusion after working so many years in food and nutrition, that it's my job inside this institution because I have access to it now to transform the institution. Um, like that's it. That's not. That's the goal. The long-term goal. Um, so that's maybe my shorter answer to your question here. It's a short and good one, right? On, right on, on spot. <laughs> maybe I can pose the same question to Patricia because uh, you working on a regional platform, you also see political changing political changes taking place in different countries. And sometimes with political movements, uh, you might miss that connection in the ministry that helped you to push and to organize. So how, how do you play out when you have those, I wouldn't call it instability, this is part of the political game. But how, we would, uh, how, how does the regional platform of SICA supports countries that are moving in different directions in the political uh, game? Yes, I think what is important here is that this topic is, a, is in the a political agenda, not only at the regional level, but also at the national and local level. So since the governments don't change uh, at the same time, yeah, so there is a, 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 a way to continue and to inform and to commit the different uh, new governments new governments, if you would like to call that. The same happened at the municipal level. And it's very interesting because in the, in the agenda of the candidates or whatever, uh, they continue talking about this and has been very interesting how this is uh, following through time. Yeah. So I think that is part of making everybody uh, have the concern about the situation and request 
these kind of topics. But that requires, as I mentioned before, a lot of a lot of work and experience at, at different levels. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, I just saw one question that maybe you and I could address. Um, it's one of the elephants in the room in this topic, which is the issue of conflicts of interest. Uh, this is, I also uh, work on the subject for a while, and this is a revolving issue in the scholarly literature. Uh, how, how we deal with conflicts of interest. People might be participating in the most stakeholder processes, not for the public good of what this process is aiming at, but rather to represent the interests of their organization, et cetera. How, how do you think we could deal with this complex issue? Um, I mean, there are lots of, no doubt, experts who are, um, who are online here who know this area inside out. I'll give a few reflections, but I doubt it will be comprehensive. Um, I think um, creating the conditions in these, uh, when you're having more uh, sort of dialogue processes, I think, um, creating conditions where people are able to call out conflicts of interest in a sort of safe environment and that doesn't feel like it's disruptive, I think is really important. And as some of the reflections at the very beginning of the session described, um, you know, working really hard to make sure that you're thinking about balance of power and the, the way that you set up those dialogues, I think should be really vital. Um, in terms of um, conflicts of interest around policy development, I think it's very important that policy developments processes are insulated from those um, real and perceived conflicts of interest, um, when it particularly when you're, you know, obviously it becomes a sharp focus when you're thinking about intervening in the food system in a way which um, might have direct implications for the food industry. Um, and uh, so I would separate out dialogue processes from um, policy development processes, they're very different stages of the, the you know, the system change process. Um, and, uh, and then, uh, but then I think there's a sort of final stage when you're consulting on policies, you might have a set of policy proposals where you're actually quite interested to hear um, from stakeholders who the policies will affect to understand whether there are unintended consequences that you might not have foreseen and flushing those out before everything's locked down. So I think thinking about where conflicts of interest create a really material impact on the policy process is really, that's the bit that we should be really concerned to protect. Um, but outside of that sphere, I think there, um, there are some real um, potential value in uh, creating spaces where they can be called out, but where nevertheless you're hearing those different vested interests because I think they're very informative if you're talking about them in a in a way which allows them to be aired um, in a transparent way. Thank you. Very very well elaborated questions. I think I'm having the feeling that I'm throwing very hard questions to you, but you are digging very well. <laughs> uh, we still have a couple of minutes. Um, maybe Catherine, one question that people um, keep asking um, in this issue is how really is practical, how in practice to balance power asymmetry in formal processes such as these mechanisms we're talking about? I'm smiling because this sounds like the, big, the, the biggest question uh, of all. Um, I guess the, the answer is that it's not that the the solution needs to be practical. It's that it's solving practical problems brings to light exactly where those interests come to play. Um, so I this, this is why I think that the dialogue is one thing, but actual policy development, you know, just to, to build on what Anna is saying here, is something different. And it's actually in that process of policy development that we can begin to uh, balance the power dynamics because, yeah, it, it must be applied to a practical problem. Excellent. Thank you very much. I see, Francisco, um, I see that you have your hand raised. Maybe if you could um, introduce yourself, I, I suppose you have an important point to share. 
thank you very much. It's just because uh, my colleague Adriano had to leave. And um, I just would like to share that uh, what, what we've been doing about it in terms of your, uh, your last question. And one of the things that it was possible to achieve in some of the Portuguese speaking countries with the um, uh, food systems governance architecture that was implemented is that each national council has a balanced participation of the different stakeholders. What do I mean about it? It means that in the statutes of each council, it's clearly indicated, uh, sorry, just me. It's, uh, it's clearly indicated the number of actors representing different social categories that will have a seat in, the, in that council. For example, vulnerable groups in most of the countries, they have uh, half of the seats and they are choosing by specific facilitating mechanisms. As for example, the mechanism we have for CFS, but it's a more structured mechanism in the sense that it goes from local to national level. So people is chosen according to the topic that will be at discussion in the National Food Security Council. And at least the majority of seats is allocated to those stakeholders. And of course, then we have an X number of cities allocated, seats allocated also to private sector, to academia, uh, and to other civil society organizations, and of course, for the government. This, in a certain way, uh, it helps, even if it doesn't solve completely the problem of power imbalances, but this helps to balance uh, the participation of the different stakeholders with different uh, capacities uh, to be involved. It's just to give an example of how things can be addressed in practice. Thank you. Excellent point. No, thank you for, for bringing this practical way and also at the same time, Give us food for thought on how the structures do matter, right? Um, all right, I'm afraid we have to start closing the panel. Thank you very much, Patricia, once again. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, thank you, Minister Francisco. And thank you, Mimadi, um, for Momedi, sorry, for uh, your remarks. And I uh, do expect to meet you once again because this conversation was really, uh, really inspiring also to myself. And um, moving on, we still have one colleague that will have the difficult yet exciting challenge of making sense of everything we have said, Mark, uh, Mark Lundi. Uh, he's the research director of Alliance Biodiversity International in SEAT, based in Cali, Colombia, where he leads the global food environment and consumer behavior team. And I know that you have been involved, uh, strongly involved in the writing of the report that we mentioned. So what is your take from this session, Mark? How can we make sense of all of the things we have raised today? Well, first of all, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to, to try to wrap this up. I think it's been a really, really rich discussion uh, and a rich discussion in the chat as well. So, I mean, I, I think there, there, there's, what's clear here is that there's a lot of energy and there's a lot of interest in pre precisely in, in how do we develop and uh, structure, sustain, nurture, a mosaic, you know, a, a mosaic of, of, of different participatory mechanisms that allow people's voices to be heard, that deal with some of these power imbalances and can effectively work at the interface between participation and policy decision-making. And I think this is, this is precisely what we were trying to get at in the report that, that we put together last year. So I think, uh, I think I would, I, you know, in addition to thanking all of the wonderful speakers, I really appreciated hearing all the insights. I thought that was, it was spot on. There's sort of some three major takeaways that I'm that I'm hearing today, and, you know. So one, we have we have this this tension right between between participation, between representativeness, uh, between power, between information asymmetries, et cetera, and and we need to find ways to navigate this. You know, are multi-stakeholder mechanisms the only way? No, clearly they're not the only way. Are they the best way? Perhaps, perhaps not. But it seems to me that what's emerging very, very clearly here is, is the need to identify and learn collectively much faster about what works and how we can manage these topics. I like the, the final comments from Francisco at FAO. I mean, there are things we can do. You know, are they sufficient? I don't know. Have we really evaluated whether they're effective? Perhaps not. So I think the issue here that we really need to start thinking about is how collectively can we take it to take stock of what is being done in this space, whether it's called a multi-stakeholder mechanism or something else, right? You know, what is that, what is that sweet spot? What needs to be done? And how do we manage some of the tension between 
representativeness, particularly when you talk about scale. So and someone who's nationally representative may not be regionally or subnationally representative. How do you manage these kind of tensions in ways that are operational? Because again, we can have long philosophical discussions about this, but we, at the end of the day, we need to move forward and we need to find ways that allow us to address as much as possible these imbalances and these issues in order to make decisions and eventually connect these dialogues and discussions to policy uh, formulation and implementation. So I think there's a, there's a key, key, key need here to learn and to, and to connect, continue to connect and have these spaces to discuss what can be done. Um, the second thing that I think is really important is to really dig into this idea of the interface between these kind of dialogues and policymaking. So we heard a great we heard great comments about the the mismatch between times. So between you know academia, between uh, between research, between the you know between policymakers, between NGOs, between civil society, et cetera, and all of that is entirely true. But still, again, we need to think about what, how, what are these interfaces and how can they work? How can we effectively allow the voices of particularly those that are most impacted by the food system, which are usually the poor, how can we ensure that the voice of, of women and youth and the poor can be included in these discussions around policy dialogues? And so I think that's, that's a second point uh, that we really, really need to get at. And I think, and I, again, I don't think multi-stakeholder mechanisms are necessarily a panacea or the magic bullet, but again, what's what are the options? What are the what else? What, how can we how can we have nested approaches that really allow us to be more more inclusive at different scales? Um, and then finally, I think the other thing that's important is, you know, there's a lot of focus and a lot of energy around this idea of we need to move to action. We've got we've gone through the UN Food System Summit, their national action plans, their coalitions, um, their working groups. There's a lot of movement and a lot of, and I think that's a, in general very positive development. But at the end of the day, you know, we need we need to think about how do we continue to push these questions that are emerging today as part of that important discussion. So understanding the institutional side of things, understanding the governance side of things is really, really critical if we want to go from these lovely discussions and 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 you know and, and coalitions and all of these plans to effective action. And so I would I would I would ask all of you who are interested in this topic to help us and to join us in continuing to highlight the need to work around these issues in, in, in emerging spaces as we, as we go forward. And so these are, these are spaces, you know, you know, global dialogues and global conversations that, that I think is where we need to keep highlighting and keep pushing this issue. And finally, in closing, uh, for those of you who haven't read this, the, the report that was developed, I would invite you to do so. Uh, we struggled with a lot of the same issues that have been raised. And I don't think we necessarily have an answer or, yeah, but we have at least some of, have, have at least tried to frame some of the concerns and we would very much welcome an ongoing dialogue with all of you around this process. So thanks, uh, Mateos and everyone else for the space. Very, very rich dialogue. I really appreciated it. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mark. I couldn't agree more. And I know I have the feeling there is rich scholarly and theoretical debate on this topic. Uh, but in my, my modest opinion, nothing beats a review of, of concrete examples. And, and that's the beauty of this report. Uh, it's um, 10 examples from national subnational cases. It's a relatively long and rich report, but there are four pages there, uh, which I'm making particular reference here, the, the, the pages of the executive summary when there's a summary of main findings. I think it's page 15 to 18, something around this. These four pages, Believe me, this is gold. This is gold. This is really, I think, it's a summary of all the issues and debates that we have been having in, in, the, theory, in the theory, in the scholarly group, uh, put it to practice in, in policy and examples. So um, I'm just trying to sell it once again <laughs> what we have been doing in this group, but this is fantastic. All right, it has been a pleasure to moderate these events. My, my deepest appreciation from all of your colleagues, the, part, the panelists, the clever questions from the audience. Uh, it was a great conversation. Uh, it won't be fair for my side to summarize all the points. Um, I would just like to maybe conclude with a consecutive invitation. This final moment, I would like to invite you for another event that is organized by the uh, Sustainable Food Systems Program, which will take place 21st of March. Uh, so it's next Monday in preparation to Stockholm plus 50. And the event will discuss the role of sustainable food consumption and production for a healthy planet and prosperity for all. Uh, my colleagues, maybe they can have the link for easy access and they can drop in the chat box, all right? So maybe let's just invite everyone to turn on the cameras one last time.
and say farewell to our fantastic audience, which had impressive comments and impressive uh, burning questions coming from the chat box. Thank you very much. And it was really a pleasure to moderate the session. Thank you.